welcome back to Bengal Bites, your home for real, raw, unfiltered talk about the Cincinnati Bengals and the NFL. As always, I'm your host, Derek. This is episode 10. This is the week three preview for the LA Rams at Cincinnati Bengals. In this episode, we're going to cover a lot of stuff. Most specifically, the Joe Burrow Calf Watch. Calf Watch 2023 is in full effect. We're also going to cover all the comings and goings with the backup quarterback situation that's been in flux this week. We're going to talk about the upcoming game on Monday Night Football, ESPN. It's going to be the Ring of Honor game where we induct Boomer Esiason and Chad Ochocinco Johnson. And also the White Bengal where all the fans are encouraged to wear white. It's going to be a white out. White helmets, white jerseys, white pants. We're going to hit on the matchup against the LA Rams. Zach Taylor's history against Sean McVay. We'll also break down the Rams scouting report, take a look at who are the players to watch, some of the matchups to watch, and how the Rams have done so far in this 2023 season. We'll hit on some of the highlights from around the NFL. We'll also go through our week three game picks. I'm gonna pick all the matchups throughout the league straight up, no lines. But we got a big show in this preview episode. If you're brand new to this show, go back and check out episode zero, where I explained who I am, what this show is all about. But basically, I've been watching and playing football, it seems like my entire life, and also really enjoy podcasts. So I wanted to bring those two things together into my own show and give you a little bit of my own voice, my own perspective on things. As always, I am not sponsored by anyone or anything. I am not affiliated with the Cincinnati Bengals whatsoever. I am completely independent, which means I can give you my own unbiased, real opinions about what's going on this season, give you a real fan perspective. If you listened to our last episode, episode 9, we did a complete breakdown of the game against the Baltimore Ravens, week 2 loss, where the Bengals went 0-2, and perhaps more importantly, we saw one of the last plays the Bengals ran on offense, Joe Burrow limping off the field, grimacing, holding his calf in pain, and working it with a therapeutic gun, massage gun on the sidelines, trying to get it loosened up. But we didn't see Joe Burrow have to go back into the game, but that was the big storyline afterwards was, what is the status of Joe Burrow's health? Yeah, it sucked to lose the game, but it sucked even more to get Joe Burrow injured. So as we said, immediately after the game in in the post-game interview, Joe Burrow just kind of said, we'll have to see how it feels tomorrow in the next couple days. Right now, it's still pretty sore, but we'll just have to see how it is. And the way he was talking in that interview and just his body language, it seemed very down, very depressed. It didn't give you a lot of confidence that he was going to be able to play in this Week 3 matchup. Then we got Zach Taylor and Joe Burrow doing their press conferences midweek. Thursday, since it's a Monday night game, everything is pushed back a day. And that's why I'm recording this podcast a day later than normal because everything is pushed back in the week. Joe Burrow and Zach Taylor did their press conferences on Thursday, and they still had the same very coy, very cautious, we'll see, we're taking it day by day. Everything is day to day, like I said with Zach Taylor. Everybody's day to day, and he even admits, like he'll be like, oh yeah, you know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, they're day to day. And then sometimes he'll say, he's been looking really good. He's actually for real day to day. So he, he's acknowledging that he's lying when he's saying other people are day-to-day. But then sometimes he's like, oh, but he's for real day-to-day. I mean it this time. <laughs> but so you don't know when Zach Taylor says Joe Burrow is day-to-day, what does that mean? Because for a lot of reasons, they don't want to put that information out there. Obviously, the upcoming opponent, the Rams, are going to have a keen interest in knowing whether or not Joe Burrow is going to be available for that Monday night game. The fans who are going to potentially buy tickets and go to the game. My friend, he wanted to, he messaged me during the game last Sunday. He was like, hey, let's go to the game. I'll buy tickets. So he goes online on Ticketmaster, cheapest tickets, decent seats. Because we want to sit, you know, somewhat near midfield. He goes online to Ticketmaster. He's looking at the tickets. They're like 165 for the seats we were looking at. Not obstructed views, but in the upper deck. Those tickets now are like 150, 140. The cheapest tickets when I was looking last Sunday 
in the upper deck with obstructed views were 130. Now they're 110 today. So prices have fallen significantly. I'm sure people on the resale market, if if and when Joe Burrow is announced out, the prices for those are going to drop. So Bengals want to keep their ticket prices high. Also, you got to think about ESPN. They're marketing this game. They're selling ads for the game. They don't want to have, you know, the backup quarterback versus Matt Stafford. They don't have Jake Browning versus Matt Stafford. They want Joe Burrow. So ESPN needs Joe Burrow so they can sell ads too because they're still selling ads all the way up to this game. So the advertisers, they don't want to sell ads for Jake Browning games. They want Joe Burrow in their games if they're going to be paying for ads. That's everybody in this whole scenario, the, the NFL, ESPN, the Bengals. Everybody is trying to keep this idea going that Joe Burrow is going to play. Joe Burrow is going to play. He's getting ready. And we he may very well play. We don't know. Right now, it's too early for me to say. And it's a tough conversation because the team is 0-2. They need a win bad. If they go 0-3, you know, their playoff chances, you're not eliminated, obviously, mathematically, but it's going to be that much harder to make your way back from an 0-3 start. If the team were 2-0 and right now, they had won both of their first two games, it might be a little bit more of an easy decision to say, okay, let's sit Joe Burrow down, let him rest for a few weeks, maybe get to the bye week, even if we lose a game or two, we got a couple wins in our back pocket already. We're already a little bit ahead of the game. We can afford to let Joe Burrow sit. Now we're already behind the eight ball, last place in the standings, and the season and the hopes of the season are quickly slipping away if Joe Burrow is not able to play. At this point, I am really conflicted. I don't know what to think as a Bengals fan because on the one hand, you're thinking, okay, if Joe Burrow had just sat out we would have lost those games anyway, but maybe he could have come back and not been injured and played the rest of the season. Then, on the other hand, well, maybe he would have got re-injured as soon as he came back anyway, so maybe it was better to just put him out there and see what he could do. I mean, when do you shut Joe Burrow down for a long term? When do you shut Joe Burrow down for a long term rest and recovery? I mean, he can't in my... I mean, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a physical therapist, but... I don't see how he can make it through every week of the season doing this kind of rehab process. He needs to rest. You know, playing a football game every week is just going to continually set him back. He's never going to really recover. So what are we really talking about here? Do we want to have an injured Joe Burrow hobbling around every game for 15 games and then hope that somehow we make it into the playoffs? Like, the Bengals already acknowledged that they're having to restrict and limit what they do on offense because of Joe Burrow's injury and his limited mobility. And you can see that. Like I said, he's the least mobile quarterback in the NFL. Even if you watch the tape of the Rams and Matthew Stafford, he is even running around and it looks like he maybe he lost a little weight in the offseason, but Matthew Stafford is even able to escape out of the pocket, roll out and find receivers on the run. Things that Joe Burrow has not done in the first two weeks. So the Bengals, Zach Taylor, and Brian Callahan as offensive coordinators, strategizers, they're going to have to figure out a way to work around a Joe Burrow who can't move, who can't run, who can't roll out. They're going to have to build an offense around a guy who is just a statue, basically, who's just going to stand there. And the offensive line, to their credit, has done a very good job. They have not given up that many sacks. They've only given up three sacks of Joe Burrow, which is much better than last year. Last year, they were giving up five or six sacks a game. So the fact that they're down to only one and a half sacks a game is a market improvement. That also, it's a, not just on the offensive line, it's a group effort. So part of that's on the running backs, part of that's on Joe Burrow himself, part of that's on the offensive line. Joe Burrow is getting the ball out of his hands at the fastest or one of the fastest rates in the NFL, about 2.5 seconds from the time he catches the pass to the time that he releases the ball and taking into account the fact that he was playing in weather in Cleveland it's probably even closer to probably like 2.2 or 2.3 seconds if it's in dry weather so he's getting the ball out of his hands quickly which leads to less sacks makes the job easier for the offensive linemen they don't have to block as long however on the on the opposite end of the spectrum that makes it harder for the receivers to get open in such a limited amount of time because the defenders know 
if Joe Burrow has to throw in two and a half seconds, this guy that I'm guarding doesn't have that much opportunity to get away. He can't go that far. So I know he's only going to stay within this limited area, so it makes them that much harder to guard. But anyway, asking the Bengals to completely change their offense around this type of highly immobile quarterback seems very difficult. And then add on top of the fact that every other team, they're going to adapt too. So when they see that the Bengals are rolling out this modified offense where the quarterback doesn't move at all, teams are going to figure out ways to counteract that and any any advantage or anything that the Bengals are able to figure out. I'm worried that the opponents are going to be have, have a counter for whatever the Bengals figure out. Okay, Joe Burrow can't move. We'll do this. And the other team is going to be a step ahead of him and counteract that. So it's going to be a chess match between the Bengals coaches and the opposing coaches throughout the season if they have to manage Joe Burrow's injury like this. We're concerned about Joe Burrow's injury for a number of reasons. The one that nobody really wants to say but is on everyone's mind, especially because of the Aaron Rodgers situation, is since this is a calf injury, what if it turns into something worse? Like if it's a grade 2 calf strain, what if it turns into grade 3? Or because those calf muscles are attached to that Achilles area, what if it makes his Achilles have to work harder and it could lead to a ruptured Achilles or something like that? Or other areas where he's compensating with his body, if he's got an injured right calf, that's his drive leg that he's trying to generate power from. If he can't generate power from his calf, he might try to use his shoulders or his elbows more or his oblique muscles, like try to turn his torso using his obliques and hips. You know, he, he could be compensating in other areas of his body that could, could strain those and lead to compensatory injuries. But as of Friday night, we still don't know his official status. We won't know, probably, up until game time. Officially, on Thursday, he did not practice. For some reason, they showed him walk out onto the practice field with his helmet, and he just stood out there and observed practice, standing and kind of walking around on that calf, not really resting it, but he didn't fully participate in practice, not even in a limited fashion. He was just standing off watching Jake Browning and... Will Greer, the two backups, take the reps, do everything in practice. All the amateur doctors on Twitter were trying to examine Joe Burrow's gait as he walked up the sidewalk. Oh, is he walking normally? Does he look like he's limping? Is he going to play based on this 25 seconds of him walking down the sidewalk? But in the interviews, they were still very coy. We'll see day to day. We're just going to take it day by day, see how it goes, see how it feels. Not sure. Joe Burrow said he's preparing as if he were going to play on Monday night, but he's not sure. It didn't really sound that confident that he would play, but not a definite no that he wasn't going to play. That led to some locker room interviews and some audio from Jake Browning saying how He's been training and waiting his turn all these years on the practice squad to finally get his opportunity to play in the league. And if it's this game or next week or whenever it is, he'll be ready to go. So he didn't really, he was noncommittal. They haven't really said he's going to be a starter. So it's kind of like one of those deals of he's given the interview just in case he does play, I guess. And we saw T. Higgins give some quotes about how he has complete and total confidence in Jake Browning and how he was throwing some perfect balls in practice and in the preseason and yada, yada, yada. We feel good about Jake Browning. <laughs> if you notice Zach Taylor, I've just noticed this, in his press conferences, he uses the adjective good way too much to describe everything and everyone all the time. So that's how they talk about Jake Browning. They say they feel really good about Jake Browning, have a lot of confidence in Jake Browning. He's done a lot of good things in training camp, made some good progress, a lot of good reps out of Jake Browning. Good reps, really good reps, whatever that means. With all this Jake Browning hype that was going on, you also saw people on social media was like, what about this Will Greer though? I mean, we saw Jake Browning in all of preseason and he was not really impressing anybody. Now granted, he was not throwing to the number one receivers. He wasn't throwing to T. Higgins and Jamar Chase and Tyler Boyd. He was throwing to a bunch of backups. But still, it wasn't really blowing the doors off. 
So a lot of people were thinking, okay, if Jake Browning barely beat out Trevor Simeon, but we got Will Greer, who is apparently better than Trevor Simeon, maybe Will Greer is better than Jake Browning, huh? So people were speculating maybe they're just trying to fake us out, make us think it's Jake Browning, but really it'll be Will Greer, surprise starting quarterback. Well, surprise, surprise, right in your eyes, as soon as we got home, New England Patriots claim Will Greer off of the Bengals' practice squad to their active 53-man roster. Bill Belichick, you scoundrel! I feel like this was not an accident. And maybe they wanted to get Will Greer on their team because they have the Dallas Cowboys coming up as an opponent in a couple weeks. But still, it felt like the Patriots were like cutting the legs out from underneath the Bengals by taking their third string quarterback when their first string quarterback is already injured. And they everybody knows that they don't have a real backup quarterback. So taking the third string quarterback, the only one who was good, man. Bill Belichick. So there's a 12-hour period there where I was really panicking. Like, I don't know why I was panicking. What am I going to do? I'm going to go play quarterback for the Bengals. But I was like, what? how are the Bengals going to you know, survive without a quarterback this weekend? They're going to have two quarterbacks. But obviously they signed another quarterback. They signed Reed Sinnott, who was the last quarterback that they had. He was basically their fourth string quarterback in training camp and got in for the fourth quarter of the last game. But like I said, Trevor Simeon was so bad, and he's already been in the league for so long that there's really no upside. He's got to be on the way out at this point. So, you know, I don't know what Trevor Simeon is going to do, but it's probably not going to be playing in the NFL anytime soon. So Reed's in it. He's got the young arm. He was firing it all over the place, even if it was 20 feet over people's heads. We know if we need somebody to throw a Hail Mary, put Reed's in it in there. He can do it. But crisis averted, Zach Taylor's not going to have to strap up and play scout team quarterback this week. They're going to have Reed Sinnott to give the defense a look at least, and Jake Browning won't have to throw every pass in practice. That being said, this Friday, we did see Joe Burrow get a limited practice session. So as opposed to Thursday, where Joe Burrow did not practice at all, Friday, Joe Burrow got a limited practice session where he was throwing in individual drills and just doing a little bit of light jogging around. So a little bit more than he did the day before, not a full participant, but you got to think if Joe Burrow is out there on the practice field all these days, if he's practicing at all, he's got to play. Like if he weren't going to play, he might as well just completely not practice and just rest it. It doesn't make any sense for him to practice and then not play. If he's practicing, he's got to play. So I would expect, unless there's some kind of major setback in his body and in his injury status, I would expect him to play if at all possible, on Monday. We did see a quote from Jamar Chase in the locker room saying he wished Joe Burrow would not play until he is 100% healthy, and the same thing he's been saying this whole time. And they asked him if he had to guess, what would he say? But his he said, if I had to guess, I would say he won't play, but that doesn't mean anything. He doesn't have any knowledge. He wasn't making an actual prediction. He was just saying he doesn't think Joe Burrow should play, basically. And I would agree with him. But for all those reasons, all so many interests, and, and Joe Burrow has an interest in playing because he just signed this major contract. That was the big story in the offseason. Joe Burrow's contract. When is he going to sign the contract? When is it going to happen? Why are the Bengals being stingy? Why are they holding out? What's the hold up here? We finally get the contract signed, and now the issue becomes Joe Burrow's calf, and when can he play? And you got to think, all this attention around Joe Burrow He wants to go out and play well. He doesn't want to sign this big contract and then immediately just sit on the bench and have his team go 0-6 and and they're eliminated from the playoffs before he even gets on the field. Joe Burrow wants to live up to that contract right away. He's got a sense of pride and he's got a sense of being on the team and not letting his teammates down. You know, all those guys in the locker room, they know they don't have a, a realistic chance without Joe. They know that they need Joe in the lineup and he knows that too so he's got to feel like he's letting his team down letting the city down letting the state of ohio down almost if he doesn't play in the game even if his body just can't do it so i really feel bad for joe burrow in this situation it's nobody's fault everybody you know we were so hyped up and then this disappointment comes and we want to blame somebody somebody must have done something wrong somebody screwed up how could they do this the team mismanaged it 
you know, it, it's not the team's fault. It's not the doctors, the coaches, Joe Bro. Everybody was trying to make the best out of this situation. It's just injuries are an unfortunate reality in professional sports. And this one happened to come at one of the worst possible times for the Bengals. But at this point, there's nothing really they can do about it other than try to make the best of a bad situation. One thing that was really interesting on Friday that happened was when Joe Burrow was out on the practice field doing his stretching, Mike Brown called Joe Burrow from his golf cart. Mike Brown summoned Joe Burrow. Joe Burrow, come to me. <laughs> and so they showed on Twitter X, Mike Brown and Joe Burrow in the golf cart driving away from the stretching line. And then, but they didn't go very far. He only drove about 20 or 30 yards out and around, just kind of in a circle. And he just did like a very tiny lap around the practice field and came back. And it only lasted like 15 or 20 seconds. So I'm not sure what the point was, what Mike Brown needed to say to him. Like, why couldn't he just call him into his office or, you know, before or after practice? But it was kind of this big funny thing where all the reporters are like, oh, I've never seen Mike Brown call somebody over to his golf cart in the 15 years I've reported on the Bengals. What's going on? So who knows what Mike Brown was whispering in Joe Burrow's ear, you know, Joe Burrow and Mike Brown are simpatico. Outside of Joe Burrow, there are a couple other injuries for the Bengals to keep an eye on. Nick Scott was out of last week's game with a concussion. He was limited on Thursday full participant in practice on Friday, so it looks like Nick Scott will probably be able to go. Joseph Osai was a full participant on Thursday and Friday. He's coming back from an ankle sprain in preseason, the last game of the preseason, so it looks like Joseph Osai will probably be able to make his season debut on the defensive edge, and that's been something that's been missing for the Bengals. They did not get any pressure on Lamar Jackson last week. Lamar actually had the lowest amount of pressure as a passer since he's been in the NFL. And Lamar's been in the league, what, five or six seasons now? That's the least amount of pressure he's faced in a game. Matthew Stafford is no Lamar Jackson, so the Bengals hopefully will have better luck against him. Another thing to keep an eye on, one thing that popped up was Irv Smith on Friday showed up as a limited participant with a hamstring injury. That's not something we've seen from Irv Smith at all this year, so that's going to be something to watch if he practices on Saturday and whether he's able to play in the game on Monday. If Irv Smith isn't able to go, it would be Drew Sample as the starting tight end and then maybe Mitch Wilcox. As we said, this is going to be on Monday Night Football ESPN. It's a doubleheader Monday Night Football where ABC is going to have Eagles Bucks and ESPN is going to have Rams Bengals. A few years ago, Bengals rarely played any primetime games, but now we're going to have to get used to the fact that the Bengals will play quite a few primetime games. And one of the things that's good about that is on Sunday, we can just relax and watch Red Zone. We can watch all the other games that are going on and the Bengals won't be playing. A lot of times I'm having one eye on the Bengals game and then trying to keep track of all the other games that are going on in Red Zone and kind of split my attention or I can't I mostly focus on the Bengals game but that means I miss out on all the other games well the good thing is now I get to watch all those other games and then I can just relax and watch the Bengals alone on Monday night if you're going to the game everybody should know that this is the white Bengal whiteout game so wear your white jerseys white hats white apparel of all kinds white and black Hopefully it's a college-type atmosphere. I know it's always cool when you see schools like Penn State do the whiteout games where everybody's wearing white and they got white pom-poms. So it would be cool if the Bengals had some kind of flags or towels or something like that to wave. I think they're going to do a flashlight strobe light on the app on their phone. So you get the app on your phone, you scan a QR code, and when you sync it up in the stadium, it'll flash all the lights. It'll, they'll probably say, like, everybody hold up your phone at a certain time, and it'll flash all the lights on everybody's phones and in sync. On top of the hype for the White Bengal, we're also going to see the Ring of Honor inductees with Boomer Esiason and Chad Johnson going in. So this started a couple years ago where the Bengals were one of the last teams in the league to recognize their former stars. A lot of teams will 
retire a player's number or put their player's name up in the rafters or around the bowl of the stadium. You see that pretty much everywhere you go, except for for the Bengals, for whatever reason. So they decided to get with the times. So the first inductees into the Ring of Honor were Paul Brown and Anthony Munoz, who were the two Hall of Fame members at that time. They also put in Ken Riley and Ken Anderson. And Ken Riley has since gone into the Hall of Fame. Ken Anderson didn't make it this year, but they're hoping that he's going to make it as one of the senior inductees next year. And that was kind of one of the kind of the impetus behind this was because Anthony Munoz and Paul Brown for so many years were the only members of the Bengals in the Hall of Fame, even though they had been around since 1968 clearly way underrepresented in the Hall of Fame. And part of the argument was, well, the Bengals don't even recognize their own Hall of Fame. You know, there's no Bengals Hall of Fame or Ring of Honor or anything like that. So maybe that was why they weren't getting the recognition from national media. So they did this push to bring recognition, bring attention to these players who played in the 60s, 70s, 80s that were good, that that just got overlooked and didn't make it into the Hall of Fame yet. Whether or not Boomer and Chad are going to be in the Hall of Fame one day, I don't know. I'm not sure who would have a better case. Maybe you can write in, or I'll put a poll up and say, who do you think would have a better case to get into the Pro Football Hall of Fame, Boomer Esiason or Chad Johnson? Boomer was an NFL MVP, and they went to the Super Bowl, but Chad did lead the league in receiving for a number of years. He was an all-pro Pro Bowler for a number of years. So both of them had very impressive resumes, boisterous, flamboyant personalities in their own different ways. But either way, that'll be a great night to see both of them inducted to get their Ring of Honor jackets, get the stripes, and go in next to Isaac Curtis and Willie Anderson and all the other members now and soon to come. So that's what we're going to be looking for before the game and during halftime, but for the game itself, let's get into a little bit of the matchup against these Los Angeles Rams. This is going to be a rematch of Super Bowl 56, although a lot of players are going to be different on both teams, so it's not a complete rematch. As we know, Zach Taylor used to be the receivers coach for the Rams. I think he was a receivers coach, maybe he was a quarterbacks coach, but he was a positional coach for the Rams before he got the head coaching job for the Cincinnati Bengals. He wasn't even a play caller or the offensive coordinator. He was just like an offensive assistant for the Rams when they won the Super Bowl. Since they won that Super Bowl, a lot of other assistants from the Rams have gone on and become head coaches. But you see a lot you see that a lot with Super Bowl winning teams, all their coordinators go off and get head coaching jobs somewhere else. Zach Taylor was not a coordinator, but he did get a he did parlay that into a head coaching job somehow. So we're gonna have to see if the student becomes the master in this scenario, or whether Sean McVay's got some tricks up his sleeve for old Zach Taylor this time. I guess he had the tricks up his sleeve in the Super Bowl too. So we're gonna have to see if Zach Taylor has some responses for that Super Bowl. Now, like I said, the Bengals are gonna have a completely different offensive line than they did in the Super Bowl. Bengals had one of the worst graded offensive lines in that Super Bowl game. So we know that they should be better, should be able to protect Joe Burrow a little bit better than they did two years ago. But a lot of players on the Rams defense have changed since then. I mean, I recognize Aaron Donald, number 99. He's the all-pro defensive tackle going into the Hall of Fame, first ballot Hall of Famer. But he's getting up there in age a little bit. He's 32 entering the back nine of his career. So when I watch the Rams' defense on tape, I don't necessarily see Aaron Donald blowing up plays and causing commotion in the backfield, just popping off the screen, just tossing guys like ragdolls. I don't see that type of play out of Aaron Donald this season. I still see good play, but maybe I just don't watch Aaron Donald that closely, but I haven't seen it popping off the screen. And the rest of the Rams' defense, you know, I watch a lot of NFL. I like to think I'm somewhat more of a hardcore fan, but I don't recognize most of the names on this Rams defense. Bunch of no-name guys. So on paper, 
you would say that the Bengals have a severe advantage over the Rams just in terms of their skill position players. Jamar Chase, T. Higgins, they should match up against these Rams secondary very well. But the Rams did a pretty good job of holding the 49ers receivers in check last week. Brandon Ayuk didn't have too big of a day. Debo Samuel didn't go off too bad. The thing that the 49ers were able to do against the Rams defense was run the ball. Their running backs, Christian McCaffrey, Debo Samuel had a lot of rushing yards or catching passes out of the backfield. Christian McCaffrey had a big pickup. So we'll have to see if Joe Mixon is able to get involved with the offense this week, kind of like Christian McCaffrey was. I didn't see the Rams putting too much pressure on the quarterback Brock Purdy for the 49ers. So hopefully the Bengals offensive line is able to match up pretty well against the Rams defensive line. But I want to see them open up some running lanes for Joe Mixon. So far this year, Bengals have really not committed to the run or tried to make the run a huge part of their offense. It's still been mostly pass, even though Joe Burrow can't really move. And it would really help if they could run more and more effectively so that it wouldn't put so much pressure on Joe Burrow to throw every single play and make something happen out of nothing. If he could lean on a little bit of a running game to pick up five, six yards on first down, that would really help out and make things a lot easier for the rest of the team. Just for the first two games, the Rams are number seven in total team defense yards per game, but they're number five in terms of fewest passing yards allowed. They've only allowed 150 passing yards per game and about 125 rushing yards per game. So if nothing else, the Bengals should aim to be more balanced in their offensive attack just because the Rams seem like they're a little bit stingier against the pass than they are against the run. And even though the Bengals are super pass heavy, they really need to get the run going, especially against a team who that's their weak point. If this were a healthy Joe Burrow, I would expect the Bengals to put up a lot of points and have a lot of yards against the Rams because they don't look that good. If the Bengals were functioning at full capacity, I would expect good things. But since Joe Burrow is going to be a little bit limited, I'm not quite sure how they're going to do. For the Rams offense, so far through two games, they are number two in the league in terms of yards per game. Just over 400 yards per game. And they are a pass-heavy team too. They're number three in the league in terms of pass yards per game at 315. And they're a little bit more towards the middle of the pack for rushing yards. They got 90 rushing yards per game. So 315 passing, 90 rushing yards per game. Still a pretty prolific offense. They put up a lot of points. The only reason they lost to the 49ers was their defense couldn't stop the 49ers offense. The Rams were putting up points at will. They've been scoring on the Seahawks. They scored on the 49ers. I think they scored on eight consecutive possessions between the end of the Seahawks game and the beginning of the 49ers game. So the Rams have not had too much trouble moving the ball on opponents and putting up points. So it's going to be a challenge for the Bengals' defense, especially their pass defense, to see whether or not they can get pressure on Matthew Stafford and how well they can hold up covering these guys in the back end. Now, the rookie star for the Rams is Puka Nakua. He has set a record in the NFL for most receptions, most catches by a rookie in his first two games. He had 10 catches his first game, and 15 catches in his second game. And he also runs the ball. He does like end arounds and speed sweeps and stuff like that. So he's touching the ball a lot, very active. And you could kind of say he's the Cooper Cup replacement in the Rams offense. When Cooper Cup was leading the league in receptions, that's basically the role that Puka Nakua has, even though the Rams don't have the exact same offense they had two seasons ago. They've got Mike LaFleur, who was the offensive coordinator for the Jets last season before he got fired. He's come in and retooled the Rams' offense. It looks different. It looks more like the Kyle Shanahan, Mike McDaniel. A lot of motion, a lot of spread formations, moving guys all around. It was interesting watching the 49ers and the Rams play each other because the, the two teams have different personnel. Like the 49ers use a lot more tight ends and they use a fullback in their position groups, whereas the Rams are a lot more wide receiver heavy. 
maybe one, a lot of 11 personnel, like the Bengals do. So the Rams and the Bengals have a very similar personnel, but watching the 49ers and the Rams, they both use motion. It was a very noticeable pre-snap motion. Motioning, when I say motion, like the wide receiver who split out wide will run in horizontal and run in towards the ball or move motion out away towards the sideline, but trying to put the defense in uncertain positions. So if you just, as an offense, if you just come out and line up in your formation and stand there for five seconds before the ball snap, that gives a lot of time for the defense to sit there and react and kind of plan and think about, okay, what does this look like? What do I expect? What am I ready for? It puts the defense in a little bit more of a bind, makes them just a little bit more confused or uncertain about what they want to do. If you send one of your players in motion, you can only move one player in motion at the snap at a time. But what a lot of teams around the league are doing is using motion to confuse defenses a little bit. You know, they what they'll do is they'll motion a guy right behind another guy so that when the ball is snapped, you've got two guys standing basically right in front of each other. So then as a defense, you're thinking, wait, who am I guarding? Am I guy guarding the guy in the front or the back? And just that little half second uncertainty of a player thinking, wait, do I have that guy or the other guy? makes it that much easier for the defense to just get a little bit of separation, just get a little bit of distance away from that defender so they can make a catch. We see a lot of teams doing this. For whatever reason, the Bengals don't like to do this, or maybe Joe Burrow doesn't like this. I've heard a lot of different things about whether it's Zach Taylor and the offensive philosophy, whether that's just something that Joe Burrow prefers. But it is very noticeable that a lot of teams motion guys around the Bengals do not. And that's one thing. I don't know why the Bengals don't use their other receivers also. Jamar Chase, T. Higgins, Tyler Boyd are playing 95% of the snaps. Jamar is over 98%. T. Higgins is over 95%. Tyler Boyd is closer to 90%. But they're playing the huge majority of the snaps to where they're getting completely exhausted. They're running every single play and they can't run anymore. Why not get some of these other guys a little bit of an action like Get Charlie Jones in there, Andre Yosivash. Trenton Irwin is pretty much the default fourth receiver off the bench right now. He's played about 20% of the offensive snaps. I don't even know if he's gotten a target in the passing game at all. So I don't know even know if they're really using Trenton Irwin, but he kind of subs in a little bit. But what about like Charlie Jones on a little speed sweep? Or if they don't want to use Jamar Chase, I feel like they don't want to get Jamar Chase hurt. He did that a couple times last year, and I don't feel like he really liked doing it. He complained about getting hit by linebackers and getting tackled too hard. And if you're a wide receiver, you know, he's not Debo Samuel out there. He's a little bit of a lighter, smaller guy, Jamar Chase. So I understand where he's coming from. Like, he's not getting paid enough money to be the Joe Mixon. Like, give the ball to somebody else. Give the ball to Charlie Jones. Let him run around and get tackled by these linebacker guys. And I'm fine with that. Put Charlie Jones out there. Give him a handoff. Let him run around. Mix it up a little bit. But, you know, give these guys a breather. Like, they're running every single play. It's hard to get open if you're exhausted. Maybe if they had a little bit fresher legs, they could get open. Anyway, for Puka Nakua, he's been dealing with an oblique injury since last week. So, you know, taking... He got 20 targets, 15 catches... That's a lot of work. Even if you are a rookie, these guys aren't robots. Their body is going to break down with more wear and tear, more catches, more carries. So we'll have to see if if Puka is able to keep up that kind of blistering pace throughout the season. Hopefully not against the Bengals. But he's number 17 for the Rams. So when the Rams have the ball, watch number 17. He's probably going to be a target for a lot of Matthew Stafford's passes. Also number 5, Tutu Atwell. He's their speed receiver. He's the one who's doing a lot of the motions. So before the snap, number five, Tutu Atwell, he'll go in motion one way or the other to try to draw the defense's eyes. And they got rid of their former starting running back, Cam Akers. They traded him. So the Rams now have a rookie, Kyron Williams, number 23, is their starting running back. And he is a shifty guy. He's not that big, smaller guy, but he looks like he's got good moves like he's able to avoid tacklers so it's going to be interesting to see if logan wilson and jermaine pratt are able to tackle him in the hole or if he's able to slip their tackles 
Rams offensive line was a story of how bad they were last year. They look like they're improved. Maybe not as good as when they had Andrew Whitworth at left tackle, but much better than they were last year. So Matthew Stafford has a little bit more time. And like I said, he's looks like maybe Matthew Stafford has lost a little bit of weight. So he's running around. He's slinging the ball all over the place, just like we know he used to do for the Lions back when he was in Detroit. He's still got just as strong as arm as ever, and he's getting away from defenders. So no arm issues. I think he had a, a shoulder or an elbow problem last year. So I think he was dealing with that throughout the season, but he looks ready to go this year. So Matthew Stafford is lighting up teams. The Bengals defenders have to be ready to break up passes and go deep. From the special teams perspective, I'm always going to say Evan McPherson is going to have the advantage over every kicker, except for maybe Justin Tucker. So the Rams have Brett Maher, who is the kicker for the Cowboys, who missed all those was it extra points and field goals and all kinds of stuff he was missing. He got out of Dallas, and he's with the Rams now. So I'm going to give the Bengals the edge in that one. On the punter, the Rams have this guy, Ethan Evans. He's averaging 51 yards per punt. He had a 72-yard punt. But he hasn't punted that much because the Rams offense is moving the ball so often. But if he does get a chance to punt, watch out for some booming punts. Charlie Jones may get an opportunity to return, though, because when you have those long punts, sometimes you can outkick the coverage team. They're not able to get down there and cover. Charlie Jones may have an opportunity. We'll see. But like every game in the NFL, it's going to be a battle. It's going to come down a lot to the strategy. What is Sean McVay able to do against Lou Anarumo's defense? What are Zach Taylor and Brian Callahan able to scheme up against Raheem Morris in this new look Rams defense? It's going to be interesting. Elsewhere in the league, some of the big stories, a lot of quarterbacks, unfortunately, are dealing with injuries. Not just Joe Burrow and not just Aaron Rodgers, but some of the rookie quarterbacks, actually. C.J. Stroud for the Texans, he had a little bit of an issue with his right throwing shoulder, but it looks like he's fine and good to go, although... Panthers number one overall pick, Bryce Young, he's out one to two weeks with a sprained ankle. So with Bryce Young out, that means Andy Dalton is going to get the start for the Panthers. The Red Rifle returns, making another start. He's popping up all over the place, playing for the Saints, the Bears. Now he's going to play for the Panthers. So the league has not seen the last of Andy Dalton yet. The Colts also ruled out their star quarterback, Anthony Richardson, he got a concussion on his second rushing touchdown where he fell back and fell back on the back of his head real hard. So he's out with a concussion. That's too bad for him. And then a defensive injury. We saw Trevon Diggs, the star cornerback, Pro Bowl cornerback for the Cowboys, tore his ACL in Thursday practice, and he's going to be out for the rest of the season. So that's really unfortunate. You never want to see a guy get hurt, especially in practice. It sounded like he was just doing like a one-on-one -on -one drill, guarding another receiver in practice, and you know took the wrong step or whatever happened and tore his ACL. So that's how easy it is to lose a star player from the defense. One of the guys you really, your team was really counting on. He's made a ton of plays. Really too bad, but I'm sure the Cowboys defense is going to have a lot of good backups to step up into his place, but. When one of the stars in the league goes down, it's never good. All right, let's get to the week three picks. Last week, week two, I finished nine out of 16. I got nine out of 16 right. So one game over 500, 500% or 50%. And that was a little bit better than in week one where I got exactly 50%. A little bit better. Let's see how I do this week. Thursday game has already happened. But, I mean, let's be honest. I was taking the 49ers over the Giants. So, I got that one. I'm going to take Browns over Titans. Even though Nick Chubb got hurt and Deshaun Watson has played like garbage, Ryan Tanhill has not looked that good. And I don't know if Derrick Henry is still the Derrick Henry. So, we'll have to see what the Titans have. I'm going to take Lions over Falcons. Even though Bijan Robinson is looking good, Lions are looking a little bit frisky. Desmond Ritter is not impressed at all, so Lions have the better quarterback in Jared Goff. I'm taking the Lions. I'm going Saints over Packers because I think Aaron Jones, if he's out, I think Aaron Jones was kind of the 
driving factor in the Packers offense. I'm taking the Saints in that one. I'm taking the Dolphins over the Broncos. I'm taking the Vikings over the Chargers. I'm not sure why. Chargers are probably pretty good, but I don't know. Vikings are at home. They need a win. I'm going Patriots over the Jets for the 15th game in a row. Jets, get it together. But we'll see. Maybe they'll surprise me. Uh, I'm I'm going Bills over Commanders. I'm going to say Jags, Jaguars over the Texans. Texans got to prove they can win a game before I pick them. The, I'm going Ravens over the Colts, even though the Ravens have like everybody out injured. The Colts don't have, uh, ah, they have Gardner Minshew. I was going to say they don't have a good starting quarterback, but they've got Gardner Minshew, who's better than Jake Browning. Hmm. I'm still going to take the Ravens because they have Lamar. All things being equal, Lamar is too good. Uh, Seahawks, I'm going to take over the Panthers, even though Andy Dalton is starting for the Panthers. Panthers do not have any offensive weapons. Nobody can get open. Adam Thielen is their number one receiver. It's not looking good for the Panthers. I'm taking Chiefs over the Bears just because the Bears are a nightmare right now. Their defensive coordinator resigned for unknown reasons and... Justin Fields was giving quotes to the media talking about how he's thinking too much, he's playing robotic, and there's too much coaching in his head, and he just needs to go out and play free and like he knows how he can. I mean, whatever, Justin Fields. If you watch the tape of Justin Fields, he was holding on to the ball forever. He was holding the ball for like five seconds. Just throw it. <laughs> I don't know what that has to do with coaching. They're not coaching you to hold on to the ball for five seconds and take a sack. But I'm going to take the Cowboys over the Cardinals. Cardinals, even though they've stayed surprisingly competitive in a lot of these games with Josh Dobbs, still going to take the Cowboys over them. Cowboys might be one of the better teams in the league right now. I'm going Raiders over Steelers. Kenny Pickett has not looked good at all for the Steelers until they get the offense going. We're going to bet on Jimmy Garoppolo and the Raiders. And I'm going to take Eagles over Bucks, even though the Bucks are 2-0. And Baker Mayfield has got a lot of people interested. I'm going to take the Eagles, Super Bowl contenders. And I'm going to bet with my heart in the other Monday night game. I'm taking the Bengals over the Rams. I'm going to say Joe Burrow plays in this game. Somehow, maybe he gets a cortisone shot or something. He, he can play through the pain and grit it out and get the win over the Rams in the white Bengal whiteout ring of honor game on Monday night football. Prime time, baby. We'll have to watch what happens over the next couple of days. But if Joe Burrow can play in this game, you get the strong feeling that he will play. And hopefully there's no more setbacks and hopefully Joe can go out and play a good game and we can get a win. But enjoy the rest of the games this weekend. Like I said, since the Bengals are playing on Monday, that frees you up on Sunday to watch all those other games. So enjoy the games. Enjoy football. But this football season is rolling right along. So if you enjoyed this show, make sure to subscribe on all the platforms. It's on Spotify, Apple Podcasts. I've got a video version up on YouTube. So if you're on YouTube, subscribe, thumbs up, all that stuff. Leave a rating if you're on one of those platforms that lets you leave a rating. Share it with your friends. I have no idea how to promote this show at all. I'm definitely not spending any money on ads. If I'm not putting any ads into the podcast, why would I spend any money on ads to promote the podcast? This is a free podcast, man. Just, you know, share it around, share it with your friends, play it at work. I'm trying not to cuss, you know, I'm trying to keep it clean. So just in case your grandma is listening in the next room, she won't be offended by anything I'm saying. So, you know, let, let grandma listen to the episode. Maybe she likes the Bengals too, you know. But wherever you are, Monday night, Make sure you're tuned in to ESPN. Be loud if you're in the stadium, wear your white. Scream your head off on third down when the Rams have the ball. If you're at home, be loud and scream your head off if the Bengals score a touchdown, unless somebody in your house has to work the next day and then they might get mad at you. But just scream into your pillow or something. Just get excited, jump around, take a nap before the game. Don't fall asleep during the game. That's the cardinal sin. Don't do that, of all things. No falling asleep during the game. Let's plan it out. Nap ahead of time. Then you can watch the whole game. We're hoping for a great game, great turnout from the fans, great night of football. So 
until the next episode when we do the complete game recap breakdown on episode 11. I'm going to leave you with a who day and stay hungry for more Bengal Bites.